Okay, CC students, we're going to talk about the rules of evidence. Now, one thing I want to talk about is that in your mock trial packet, you have general rules that regulate how we conduct the mock trial. It talks about um, who may participate. It, it tells you that you can't watch videos of previous year's mock, tri mock trials. Those are all over overall rules of that we've all agreed to abide by for mock trial. But then while we're trying the case, as we're, as we're presenting evidence, as we're performing the mock trial, there are certain rules that regulate uh, the behavior of how the uh, mock trial occurs. And this is the same as, as it is in real trials uh, by real lawyers. We have things called rules of evidence. And the mock trial rules of evidence that we use are modeled after the federal rules of evidence. And uh, we'll talk a, a little bit about these in other videos that we're going to do. But in this video, I just want to talk overall about rules of evidence. And remember, the parties have a disagreement about what occurred. They both have uh, varying theories. They have varying uh, stories about what occurred. And they each try and prov pr uh, prove their case by testimony and exhibits. So they have testimony as witnesses. They also have exhibits. And we're bound by these rules of evidence as we begin to prove our case. So we're either going to prove it through the testimony of a witness or along with that testimony, certain exhibits that we're going to use to help prove our theory of our theme of our, our theory of our case, which goes along with our theme of our case. Now, evidence in of itself um, can be testimony, can be documents, can be exhibits, can be physical evidence like a gun. Now, we don't have a gun in this mock trial, but it could be this. And evidence can also be one, uh, uh, two other things. It can either be uh, direct evidence, or it can be circumstantial evidence, or it can be both. Now, you're, you're probably wondering where I'm getting this information from. This is from the back of your mock trial packet, uh, where it talks about the judge's instructions to the jury. Uh, it talks about direct and circumstantial evidence. And I just want to touch on that as we talk about evidence, because I think it's an important uh, concept that you would understand. So let's talk about what direct evidence is. Well, direct evidence would be um, a witness coming into court and uh, saying, um, here's a diagram of what occurred, here's what I saw, here is what um, the testimony, that's all direct evidence that comes from the witness that is evidence being heard by the jury. What's circumstantial evidence? Well, circumstantial evidence is, um, think about this. If you're inside your house and you don't have any windows, you can't see outside, and you smell in the springtime, you smell that smell of rain on concrete, and you also can feel the air temperature change. Now, you haven't looked outside the window, and maybe your mom or dad comes inside and they have uh, their hair's wet and their clothes are wet and they have that droppings on their shirt like they've just been in a rainstorm. Now, you didn't actually see it rain, but the smell is circumstantial evidence. The, uh, what you saw, what you observed is circumstantial evidence. So it can either be uh, direct, you go outside and you see it raining and you testify about that, or circumstantial evidence is, I saw all these other things and all these other things, there may be some other explanation for it. Maybe the sprinklers came on and this looks like this is how somebody got wet and, and I could just be mistaken, but all those other things are circumstantial evidence. So we'll, we'll talk more about that in the next videos. But in our rules of evidence, we don't allow testimony in court that is irrelevant, that is incompetent, that is untrustworthy, or is unduly prejudicial. And what do I mean by that? Well, irrelevant evidence is evidence that's outside uh, the scope of what we're, our disagreement is. So here's an example, and, and, and uh, I'm not gonna lead you either one way or another. Let's just talk about this in general. In your mock trial, um, the defendant uh, has been married previously, okay? There could be an argument made that that is irrelevant. Whether or not uh, the defendant has been married previously is not relevant, could be argued, is not relevant for the fact of whether she killed her husband this time. However, there is an argument that could be made that that testimony is relevant. And um, I'll leave you to your own conclusions on how to make that determination. Obviously, if one side thinks that the testimony of the defendant being married previously is relevant and the other side thinks that it's irrelevant the judge is going to make that determination on relevance and one thing that is going to come down to is whether that is unduly prejudicial uh, 
you know, is it to allow it in? Would it be unduly prejudicial? Or another thing we would like to say: Would it confuse the jury? Would it? Uh, so, th th that's one thing to look at it. Um, if you stick to the facts that are in your mock trial packet, and don't uh, go outside of those, all those facts are relevant because they are part of the uh, packet. Um, so, any other any other evidence that's outside the scope could be argued as irrelevant or even facts within the packet as I said about the previous marriage um, could be relevant and could be not relevant however um, that's for a judge to decide and here's the facts when we get to objections we'll talk about this if is if nobody objects to it it comes in so we'll talk more about that an objection so things that are relevant are allowed things that are not relevant to the case are not allowed and that's for you to determine as students what is relevant what is not relevant incompetent well your packet clearly says that all witnesses are competent so we are not going to have any question about whether a witness is incompetent this is not coaching this is just going through what the packet says um, untrustworthy so evidence that is untrustworthy is excluded if for some reason someone's testimony is deemed to be untrustworthy then that evidence is is not uh, allowed or not is not giving weight to the determination, and um, I want to. I'm trying to stay away from giving you examples because I want you to figure this out on your own. I just want to lay out what this is, um, and as I mentioned, unduly uh, prejudicial. Here's what unduly I did describe that about relevance, but here's what unduly prejudicial is not. Uh, if you're the defense and you don't want evidence about somebody committing murder to come in because it's too unduly prejudicial well guess what everything that is against the defendant that is admissible is prejudicial by its very nature it's just whether it's unduly prejudicial um, and that's for you to make arguments about not for me to tell you so when we have a, a evidence questions like I said it doesn't become an issue unless the attorney objects and then the judge rules on it so everything comes in until an objection is made and the judge makes a determination about whether or not it is allowed. And the judge is going to rule three ways, hopefully two, but maybe a third way. One is going to be they're going to sustain the objection. When I say sustain the objection, that means stop, don't answer the question. The judge has sustained. Somebody has objected to the question. The judge says sustain, that's stopped. Overruled means you keep going. The judge says uh, the attorney asks a question, the other side objects. The judge says, overruled, I'm going to allow the question. You keep asking the question. So sustain, you stopped. Overruled, you continue. Sometimes the judge will take it under advisement. What that means is they're not going to make a ruling on it. That's basically saying we're going to overrule the objection. We're not going to make a ruling on it this time. So they don't uh, overrule the objection. They just note it. Um, so it may be uh, they'll take it under advisement and rule on it in a couple questions later. Again, all important for you to know. Sustained, you can't ask that question. Overruled, continue. And advisement, continue. And as I said, all witnesses are competent. However, there's two uh, very distinct types of witnesses that we have in our mock trial. We have lay witnesses, and those are people that can only testify to what they observed. Only testimony based on their mock trial packet. Expert testimonies. Experts can testify based on their testimony or their exhibits in the mock trial packet, but they weren't at the scene. They have a special uh, qualification. So in order for them to come in and talk about something that they are finding as an expert, you have to qualify them as an expert. And we'll get into that in um, as we talk about how we put exhibits in. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that. But they have to be qualified. So and it's only to your case materials. So what happens if uh, you want to attack, based on the rules of evidence, a witness? You're going to impeach the witness. Now, not like the impeachment of the president. Impeaching the witness means you're uh, going to attack on the credibility of a witness. In other words, you're saying you should not believe them. And in fact, uh, I wrote down here on page 106, on page 106 in your mock trial packet, where it talks about the jury instructions, here's what the judge says about impeaching a witness. Page 106 at the bottom. To impeach a witness is to prove such witness is unworthy of belief. I instruct you that a witness may be impeached by disproving the facts to which the witness testified, B, by proof of general bad character, C, 
by proof that the witness has been convicted of a crime involving moral uh, turpitude. D, by proof of contradictory statements previously made by a witness as to matters relevant to his or her testimony in the case. If an attempt has been made to impeach any witness by proof of contradictory statements previously made, you must determine from the evidence, first, whether any such statements were made, and second, whether they are contradictory to the statements that the witness made on the witness stand, and third, whether or not it was material to the witness's testimony and to the case. Here's the key to this. The judge says, if you find that a witness has been successfully impeached by proof of previous contradictory statements, you may disregard that testimony unless it is corroborated by other witnesses. So wait, what that means is that you don't have to listen to or believe that witness's testimony. Now, if it's been corroborated or supported by another witness, then you should then you have to believe that evidence. But however, if a witness, uh, if their testimony has been impeached because you proved that they said one thing in one statement and then on the stand they said another, you have impeached their testimony and by those four ways. Also in your uh, mock trial packet, there's some ways that you attack them. Uh, you can attack, uh, attack them by their character or conduct. Now this only comes up if uh, you can only uh, attack this it, the est the um, evidence can only be to their reputation, and if the reputation is called into question, then you can present evidence to bolster their credibility. I would not worry about this so much in your mock trial packet because there are clearly other areas that you can impeach a witness on. But and and really, um, you have to decide if there's a witness you could call that could basically build up the uh, credibility of a witness. That's for you to decide. But the other one is evidence of a crime that you can impeach on. So remember, we can impeach on uh, inconsistent statements. We can impeach based on um, uh, inaccuracies. We can in impeach based on character or their conduct. We can also impeach a witness's credibility based on evidence of a crime that they've previously convicted. And your mock trial packet talks about uh, two separate ways, and they say if punishable if the crime that they were convicted of was punishable by X or if the crime involved something else and you need to determine whether if you're going to impeach a witness based on a previous conviction if that conviction qualifies under this this is very um, high level difficult concepts even for lawyers to understand and we're going to get into this when we get into um, objections. But this is an overview about the rules of evidence and the rules of evidence that guide us. So really, we're only allowing things that are relevant that, and witnesses that are competent, uh, testimony that is trustworthy, and testimony that is not unduly prejudicial. So those are the things that we're going to have. We're only going to hear relevant things and things that are competent. And again, it, it's based on um, the rules of evidence and filing and, and raising objections. We'll get into those in the next two videos. This is my overview about the rules of evidence. Sorry, it's a little longer than the others, but this is a difficult concept. Look forward to seeing you in the next videos. Thanks.